Save the Planet politics is growing across the globe, but our Green parties, be they UK, European or Canadian, as we'll see in this programme, ready to come in from the fringes and deal with the realities of government. Welcome to Roundtable. Hello for me, David Foster. It is all very well saying the end of the world is nigh, and more and more are saying it, but is there really a green consensus growing worldwide about what needs to be done? While left and right continue to battle, there is another power on the rise, green parties, and support for them is growing, especially in Europe. They're present in nearly 90 countries around the world. At this year's EU elections, Green parties boosted their number of members at the European Parliament from 52 seats to 71. Germany's Green Party came second in those elections with 21%. Finland's Greens came second with 16%. In France, they came third with 13%, whilst Ireland's Green Party trebled its previous vote share to reach 15%. Once dismissed as a single-issue party, its supporters argue that mainstream politics is finally acknowledging a core Green message, that no political decision can be divorced from the health of the planet. The economy, military spending, fighting inequality, farming and so on all will have an impact. So are the Greens and their brand of politics here to stay? Very pleased to say that joining me at the round table from Nova Scotia, Halifax in Nova Scotia, Canada, Joanne Roberts, who's interim leader of Canada's Green Party, with me in the studio, Michael Holder, environmental journalist for Business Green, Rashid Nix is here, UK Green Party spokesman, and Peter Newell, professor at the University of Sussex, who deals, among other things, with environmental politics. Joanne, I will come to you uh, in a little while. Normally, we go to our guests at a distance, first of all, just to make them feel included. But I want to just sort of get some general feelings about UK Greens at the moment. So excuse me, Joanne, for the moment. Peter, uh, you've just written this book, Global Green Politics. And one of the contentions that you make is it's not just about the environment the Green Movement? No, it's not. The Green Movement's always had to deal with a broad range of issues around the economy and how it's organised in relation to security, questions of democracy and peace. There's always been a much broader range of issues that Green politics has had to deal with than just narrow environmental concerns. Why do you think support appears to be growing? Well, I could go through some of the figures in, in Europe, but it is undeniable, isn't it? It is. I think there's a whole range of reasons. Um, partly, obviously, people are aware of climate change more than they were before. We've seen movements like Extinction Rebellion putting the issue on the agenda. Um, but I think people are more and more seeing the connections with other issues around health and well-being and welfare. And all of those things are also about green politics. It's not just concern for the environment. Michael, you, one of the things you look at is, is the business side of this, how, how green politics blends in with, with the, the corporate, the capitalist world. When it comes to costings, do, it, do anything that they say make economic sense? I think it, it depends less on the exact figure that they may put up as a headline figure. I think quite a lot of it actually is important how that money breaks down. So some things that could be an investment in the future of the economy, which will bring money back in, and that's quite a, 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 a secure investment. But there are some things we don't know exactly how they might spend. Okay, might so, so how, cost. how realistic is it for the Green Party and Rashid, I'll ask you about this in just a moment. Green Party UK to say we're going to spend 100 billion a year preventing climate change by the year 2030. That 100 billion pounds a year. Again, I think it depends how that money is being spent and depends on, uh, they would have presumably argue that right now is a really good time to, to borrow because the cost of borrowing is quite low and argue at the same time that actually the cost of not doing something about climate change will be much larger. So I think there's a bit... So there's not that... necessarily a clash here. Well, <laughs> again, it, money we haven't seen enough in the manifesto to say exactly how that money would be spent. And actually, I think we need to move away from a situation where that's being told as kind of spending money and actually an investment, because you know, this, as we've said, is an all-encompassing yeah. issue. It's holistic and touches And is that the way you the would economy. see it, Rashid? It's an investment in the future? It has to be an investment in the future. I think the, the way the uh, political system is currently operating is very short-term. There's no real vision for for the future generations. And this idea of investment in, in the future is something that political parties don't really take on board. So, so it's money spent that will be returned, 
in kind, not just money that will be spent. Absolutely. If, if you imagine, we seem to think that we live in a planet which has infinite resources and we can continue to consume from here to eternity. It doesn't actually work like that. At some point, we have to make those really painful decisions. And the Greens are saying, let's make the, the, the decisions and the investments now as opposed to putting it off and putting it off until it's too late. OK. I, I was looking at the manifesto from January 2015. Green Party paper anyway. Uh, parents will be entitled to two years paid leave from work, which should, would cost some people suggested 240 billion a year. The England football, rugby and cricket teams would no longer play against countries where normal, friendly, respectful or diplomatic relations are not possible. Uh, Britain will leave NATO, the arms industry converted to producing wind turbines. I don't know how much of that is current policy today, but some of it's a little bit wacky. A bit wacky? Um, well, one person's wacky is another person's vision. What I would say, and I wish you would have picked up on this one, was the idea of closing the, um, the tax loopholes which corporations and the super wealthy exploit you know, continuously. According to um, UK Uncut, I believe the figure is £120 billion a year is not collected by HMRC. So if you're talking about where's the investment money going to come from, let's have a level playing field when it comes down to taxation. Why should the, uh, the, 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 the director of a company pay tax at a lower rate than the cleaner. That doesn't make any sense. No, I get that, but I mean, mm. the, the, uh, free condoms for people so the world doesn't get overpopulated. Is there, is there an issue with that? Just... I, I, I don't know, but I mean, are you saying that this is all part of a green agenda? And if so, green in what way? In terms of population control, that's, that's obviously, that's always going to be a pressing issue. I think we're, right now, we're about 7.5 billion people. And like I said, with this planet, we do not have an infinite number of resources that we can continually exploit. At some point, we have to make these decisions. So this is a global um, hoped-for wish list. It's, it's not necessarily for a country like uh, Great Britain, where perhaps we're seeing almost negative population growth. It, it, it's for places in Africa, Asia and so on. This Green, is what you'd like to see. Well, the, well, the Greens being the only really international political party there is, we have a very global outlook. Yeah. Which leads us to, to, to Joanne in Canada and Halifax. Um, how global is it? Well, I think uh, we're fortunate in that we're a global party, but as you're hearing, we're very much rooted in the countries we're in. When we've just completed an election here in Canada, we're uh, an oil producing state. So we were fighting over pipelines and we were fighting over carbon taxes and uh, a universal basic income and pharmacare. So I think while our values are global, um, our policies tend to be rooted in the countries we're in. OK, and, and specifically in Canada, you talk about the, the pipeline. What has caught the public's imagination? Well, we, we have a government that says it wants to be net zero by 2050, and um, then it, it bought a pipeline that will triple the size of our oil sands. You just can't do both things. So I think the public is starting to say, you've got to tell us how you intend to actually do this. OK, Peter, I see you nodding in agreement with that, or, or just at the point that Joanne is actually making. But when it comes to the hundreds of billions that would be spent yep. um, on net zero, carbon zero, uh, population. How do you go about that without bankrupting a country in the first place? Well, one thing is about redirecting money. I mean, there's vast waves of money that go towards Trident nuclear weapons in this country. Um, there are 10 million uh, US dollars um, a minute that go towards fossil fuel subsidies around the world. There are numerous ways in which money is being badly deployed if we're in a climate emergency. So one of the key things is not just about generating new money, it's about redirecting flows of finance away from polluting industries and towards you know, green jobs and infrastructures. Uh, and you know, the whole debate we're having, not just in this country, but around the world, around the Green New Deal. Greens were at the forefront of that idea over a decade ago. And other parties now are picking up on those ideas. But that's very much about you know, stimulating the economy, pushing it in a newer direction. But some of it will be about redirecting existing flows of money. It's not just about generating new, uh, new funds from, from taxing polluters. I mean, is it an international coalition? You know you say it's country by country, region by region, but, but, but what are the international common grounds? Well, I think if you're in Madrid, um, you know, the first two weeks in December, you will see Global Greens in action. 
Uh, we will be at COP25. Uh, Elizabeth May, who has just stepped down as our leader, but who still sits as an MP, uh, has attended every COP since they started, so all 25 of them. And uh, that's a great time for Global Greens to get together. To so, so for those who don't, don't follow the, the lingua franca, that, that is the climate change conference? It uh, is. Uh, well, part of it anyway, yeah, okay. Yeah. It's where we set these famous targets that everybody talks mm -hmm. about. You know, we hear about the Paris targets. That was the Paris meeting. So the, this will be the Madrid targets, the Madrid agreement. Um, but that's where you see global greens coming together, sharing best profits. You know, I would agree with Peter on this, that we're not talking about bankrupting countries. In fact, we are talking about redirecting funds, investing in the future, being prepared. I mean, we've had a lot of climate incidents here in Canada and insurance companies are telling us, you've got to start doing this, it's costing you too much. Okay, what do you make of the Greta wave? Well, Greta Thunberg, of course, but I mean, it, she, she has, she's taken this to new, new heights. Yeah, she has. And she has reminded us of our generation um, that we have the ability right now to do something and it is our children and grandchildren who we we are going to answer to uh, and I give them full marks they've they've taken it to a level that we haven't been able to yeah so perhaps you you're, you're riding a bandwagon you're riding a wave of popularity all of those people I mean are children pressurizing their parents Michael this one's for you for anybody are they pressurizing their parents and grandparents into having a global conscience when perhaps they don't really it seems that way. I mean, certainly we've seen in the UK over the last year and across the world, we've seen kids going out on the streets, getting out of school, going on protests. And in September, I think millions of people around the world joined their children on the streets to call for the same thing. So there is a joined up movement there. And I think we are seeing the impact on that on our politics. You know, the, I think in Europe, the European elections in May, there was a, a European surge in, in the green vote, I think around 10%. And that's already had a tangible impact on the policy outlook. So we've got uh, a new commission coming in in December which has already said they're going to push for a Green New Deal for a net zero target across Europe. Um, the European Investment Bank has just announced it's going to drop fossil fuel investments by the end of 2021. You're right, at 10%, it's yeah. 70 MEPs out of 700 sure. something. But very different in different countries, don't you think? When, when you take a look at 22% uh, support in Germany, 41% in, in the Netherlands, 39% in, in, in Sweden, now the biggest um, party in parts of Germany. We've got more support in Germany than anywhere else. Northern European countries. Sure. Uh -huh. Yes, it's important to remember as well, I mean, in parts of Italy and, and other parts of Central and Poland, there were no green MPs. But does, it, is it, does it normally so follow the pattern it's the universal. more advanced industrialised economies? I, I, I would say it's... Sorry, sorry to cut you. I, I would say it's also um, down to our political system. We have this first-past-the-post system over here. So a lot of people might have sympathy for green ideas and green policies, but when they go to the ballot box, they think, well, what chance will my, do I have that my vote is actually have a, have a count, have a, have a difference? So until we really make steps with how we change this first past the post system in the UK in particular, very antiquated, you know, places where the Greens do well, they, they have a PR system. But why would you but, say... Uh, you yeah, yeah, the, yeah, please. The same is true in Canada. We have a first past the post and we've been more successful than the UK in electing we got a million votes in this last election and three MPs. Uh, the Bloc Québécois had a million votes and 32 MPs. All of their MPs were in one province. Ours were spread out across the country. It's just, it's, it speaks to what's wrong with first past the post. Okay. Wait, Can I just say also globally, yeah, if you think even in Latin America, in Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, Greens have representation in parliaments there. Um, in uh, Congo, in um, Africa, and there's one other African country which I'm going to forget now. But there's, there's, you know, there's growing representation in other parts of the world. I mean, the largest environmental movement in the world is actually in India. And of course, if you think about environmental defenders as a key part of the environmental movement, you mean proportionately, movement, or because there's just a, a huge amount of people there? 
No, I mean, proportionately, there's, you know, there's a huge, there's a long tradition of very strong levels of environmental activism against dams around, you know, water projects uh, and so on. There's some very strong environmental NGOs in India. It's a very, very powerful movement. I mean, almost going back to the days of Gandhi and so on, a lot of those key ideas about self-sufficiency and uh, non-violence and so on shaped the, the environmental movement. So I'm just challenging this idea that it's a sort of northern European phenomenon. I think it's global and it's been around for centuries in different forms. So, so how do Greens have influence in countries where they're not necessarily represented the way that they, they would like to be? And what sort of influence do they have? Well, so part of it's about electoral politics and the ways we've been describing, but it's also about pushing issues onto the agenda, whether it's Green New Deal, climate emergency, asking questions about the role of nuclear energy. All these sorts of things force other parties to, to adapt. And it's also not just the national level politics, it's also local councils where Greens are, are well represented. So it's sort of all levels of politics and government where they're engaging and shifting agendas um, and holding other politicians and parties to account. And is that what you do, Rashid? You, you, the Green Party stays on the fringes but make sure that these issues are noticed well, we, and taken we, seriously? Well, we have to make enough noise to make sure that the issues never go off the agenda. And it's really interesting to see that, you know, for 2019, the Conservatives are talking about how green they are. Labour taking up the, 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 the Green New Deal. The Lib Dems are talking about vote yellow to get green. And you think, OK, well, everyone's taking our sweets, which is, a, which is a good thing for the general population. Maybe for us as the Green Party, maybe people see us more as being... They're a, stealing your clothes. Well, they see us being more as, a, as, a, as a, 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 a think tank. And we come up with the good ideas, which they yeah. may, maybe aren't bold enough to come up with themselves. And then, and then when they realise you know, oh, this does actually have some, some sway amongst the population, we'll take it now, you know? That's OK, so they're using it because they recognise the popularity mm -hmm. that is coming into this. What about business, Michael? And, and please don't think I'm only asking you about business. It's anything you want to say. Mm -hmm. But have businesses come around to the idea that they have to now adopt some kind of green cloak, if you like, because otherwise they're going to lose business, they're going to lose their profitability, um, they won't be taken so seriously. A slightly cynical view of it? Well, hopefully it's more than just a cloak, but also I think it's important to dis distinguish between, we talk about business, for example, and there's, there's, there are some businesses that are very, uh, well, laggards on this, that aren't really making the efforts they should be, and they're quite far behind on it. And there are a number of businesses that are pushing much harder than a lot of governments are in terms of decarbonising the economy and what they want to achieve. And, you know, so there's a big disparance between some ambitious businesses and some less ambitious businesses. But the truth is that if you want to operate um, in the future and, or even today, then you have to be making those efforts. We've seen oil companies starting to lose their social license. I think some arts organizations have dropped sponsorship of BP and, and people like that. So it's, it's crucial at this point and consumers are moving in that way. If, if you don't do something positive for the environment, if you aren't justifying your existence in the future economy, then and frankly, you're going to you're going to go out of business. That's, Green movement's been around since the 1970s, sort of round about the 80s. It started to sort of get some kind of sway. Uh, then it was very popular. Then it dropped off again. So what is to prevent the same thing happening now? That is the broader question for the environmental movement and for the Green Party as well, but, and for business. I think to keep it on the agenda, to keep that momentum going, it is crucial. And I think there's a bigger chance that it will. I think there have been peaks and troughs in the past, but there's more of a sense that this maybe is around to stay. And I think partly that's being driven by consumers. People are living their lives and recognising, you know, it's a bit warmer today, it's a bit unusual. Or in, well, you know, in parts of the Alps, they sort of see that the glaciers are melting, for example. It's yeah. hitting people's lives in a tangible way. Joanne, yes, I was going to come to you next anyway to ask about how do you keep the Green Party relevant in terms of popularity? Well, I, I think two things have, have really added to the momentum right now. One is, you're right, the youth movement and, and the action they're taking. But, you know, when we see fires in the Amazon, fires in Australia, fires in California, when we see flooding throughout Canada, I mean, they're calling flooding the new fire in Canada right now. I mean, hurricanes, we just came through one here in, in Halifax. I mean, I think that is driving it home for voters, that um, the question of, is climate change real is done. So now is how will we deal with it? And I think credibility on this issue is important. Yes, like the UK, the Liberals and the, De the Democrats in Canada are eating our lunch. They've all got, they've all of a sudden, you know, sort of have the green religion, uh, but they don't have the credibility on the file. And so you need Greens, if nothing else, to keep them accountable. 
Children are extremely idealistic, which is a wonderful thing because they, they have a certain innocence, some might say a naivety. Uh, what is to stop that changing when they encounter what some people might refer to as the real world? Well, I think... You know, I would love that we didn't need a Green Party because everybody was doing the right thing. But I think uh, Greens might be, uh, children might be idealistic, but they're not blind. They may become a bit more practical as they get older, a bit more political. But I think they know better than anybody that a four-year cycle doesn't solve any problem. So um, it's a, incumbent upon Greens to continue to have practical solutions to, to be economically, fiscally responsible. I mean, I think we have been on the forefront of, of not only good environmental policy, but good social policy. And um, we keep doing that, and we'll have some success. Peter? Yeah, no, I would agree with all of that. I think the key thing is just to say green politics, again, as I said earlier, is about, about economy, society, democracy, security. It's about all of those things. So it's making those connections. And, and also and having what we'll keep sensible alive. politicians who don't go around suddenly saying, I'm going to double the cost of fuel um, to help invest in the environment, which has happened in the past, and thereby you know, alienating millions of people. Well, you've got to well be real. you were just talking about the children, right? So we, how do you defend their wealth and their right to breathe, breathe air? At some point, you have to sort of accelerate transitions away from polluting vehicles, whether that's diesel or something else. So there has to be, you have to have, that's what government has to do, right? They have to do the bold thing, the right thing uh, on behalf of the whole but, of society. But you also have to be realistic because motorists. the day you say, I want every car off the road except for mine, and yeah, that right. happens. No they, one's they, saying that. <laughs> no, but that's what that's like NIMBY, isn't it? Not in my backyard. It would be, words, but, but no I, one... I want all the luxuries of the modern lifestyle, but I, I want to decry anybody else from ruining the planet. Yeah, but no one is saying that. So uh, I think, I mean, you know, what the Green Party and, and many others... Rashid, then forward. back yeah. to you, Joanne, Sorry. yeah. Can I say, um, here we are in, in the middle of London, and every year in London, 9,500 people die because of poor air quality. That means that there's going to be 9,500 families at least affected by a, a, a bad environment. If we keep making our decisions further and further away from the situation where we are today, then all we're doing is creating future havoc. A young man said to me recently, we're talking about this issue, he said, he said, all the stuff that we think is really important, that we spend all our time chasing after and buying, he said, take all your stuff, add up the value of your stuff, but whilst you're adding up the value of your stuff, hold your breath. And he said, in about 45 seconds, you'll realise what's really important. And I think we get hung up in stuff and we don't really think about the wider, yeah. bigger picture. Talked about how popular the Greens are in Germany. There are some people suggesting that next... I think it's next year? German elections. There could be a Green Party chancellor, the first major leader of an international... or a, a big hitter when it comes to... Uh, international e economies. Do you think that's possible? I think anything's possible at this point. Um, really, just the, the change that we've seen even in the last year in terms of how climate change is seen as a topic by a broad spectrum of the public. I mean, if that continues to surge, anything's possible. I mean, it is hard to imagine, I think, the Green Party holding sway and governing an entire party in one of the biggest uh, economies in the world. But I think there's a bigger challenge that really is faced, that the Green Movement faces in the next 10 years. There's two, really. One is, I think we've touched on, is that we haven't really got to a point where we're talking about policies that really impact on people's daily lives. So, yeah, it's going to be things about changing people's diets. Yeah, it's going to be things in this country, in, in the UK, about taking people's boilers out of their homes, for example, and installing... But equally, that is system. telling them what to exactly. do. Exactly, and that's, that's a real challenge. It's an argument that the Green parties have yet to win. And I think beyond that, there's also... You know, talking about whether the green movement can stay a green, a, a green issue for the broader politics, I think it probably can. The question is what direction that goes when it gets co-opted by different movements. So there's a bigger question about how, you know, far-right parties might take this on and turn it into an eco-fascist movement. You know, it's, it's, it's a very core issue that crosses a lot of yeah. things and it's about social and we've justice. We've already talked well. on this programme about eco-side, which is a, a mm. different argument altogether. But I'd like to ask you this. How do you prevent the Green Party becoming a lecturing nanny group <laughs> well you know what i think what we haven't talked about is the value of when greens win because it's the one thing that um, in many places we have yet to cross that barrier and we're seeing it in canada so elizabeth may was our first green elected mp now we have three in the house of commons for the whole country but in prince edward island which is the province next to, to the one i'm in their official opposition there 
And Prince Edward Island is, is bringing forward progressive politics right now, good housing policy, uh, setting better targets. I, I get all that, but, it, but it's a do this, do that, do it. It's a do that my way type of approach, isn't it? And but, how, but how, I, do, I you, how do you prevent wrong. the Greens from looking condescending? But that's what I'm saying. In PEI, they're not looking condescending. They're looking like people as part of the community that are saying, let's find something that works for us. The same is happening in, BE, uh, in BC and in New Brunswick, where in BC, they, they hold the balance of power. And in New Brunswick, they're close to holding the balance of power. And what they're seeing is, is rational voices uh, that are not always about self-interest. That will make a difference. If I'm still around in 50 years, it'd be fascinating to see what's happening. If I'm still doing this program in 50 years, oh, please lead me to the door. I don't mind being told what to do at that point. In fact, I probably won't even know what you're saying. Listen, thank you so much indeed for coming on. Uh, Michael, Rashid, Peter, Joanne, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for watching Round Table. Uh, for me, David Foster from the team, we hope to have your company next time. For now, goodbye.